He's worthy, 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 worthy of it all. So glad that you are here, delighted that you are here. We know that uh, on a Sunday morning there's a lot of places that you could be, and it is our honor and privilege to have you at Wellspring, especially if you are visiting for the very first time. We are glad that you are here. This place is all about real people finding real hope in this real world. So maybe today you feel a little discouraged. I think you're going to find the real hope in Jesus. Come on, can we give God some praise for what he's going to do today? Hey, can we keep those hands going for all of our new people? Come on, let's welcome them. Awesome, awesome, awesome. Hey, a couple things that I want to give to you before we go any further. I want to remind you, I think as uh, people are starting back, I, I talked to two couples um, on the way out of the 9 o'clock uh, while we were getting ready to greet you coming in for the 1045, that this was their first weekend back since COVID. And they said, we haven't been back, we've been watching online, but we haven't been back, and we're just not sure, like, where to go? And so I want to invite you to be a part of something we've been doing around here for years. We've changed it up a little bit for your convenience. Uh, we call it Wellspring Culture. It is the beginning, it's the first door, or the introductory door to all things Wellspring. And uh, so we just had it this morning, and we want you to know that it's coming up in a few short weeks, and so you can go to wellspringfl.com slash next steps. That is your next step. Uh, getting plugged in, finding groups, or serving, or what we believe, or what to do, or how the church started, whatever it may be, you can go to that link and you can register for Wellspring Culture, and uh, most of it's done online, and so there's some assessments, you'll learn your spiritual gifts, you'll, we're big into the Enneagram, and so you'll learn what your Enneagram number is, and how that matters to all this thing, and you'll learn our story, all of those good things, and so go on, you can sign up for that, and then there's a once a month a gathering that happens, it happened this morning, where you'll come and kind of turn in all your stuff and get plugged in and find out where the best fit for you is, and so you can get that on that website. And then secondly, we are partnering, uh, can you believe that we're like nine weeks away from Christmas? Like it just feels crazy, nuts, 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 crazy, crazy, crazy. And so uh, we are um, going to be partnering with several organizations over the next few months. This first one that I want to make you aware of is Metropolitan Ministries. We are doing an, uh, uh, an event with them called the Holiday Tent. It's an incredible outreach opportunity for you and your family, your kids, all, all, your family, your, your spouse, your, your nieces and nephews, your dogs and your cats, whatever. Uh, come be a part. We're going to be helping distribute uh, food and presents all for the whole Tampa Bay area. It's local. Like, I think it's Why Mama. Come on, Why Mama? Right here locally. And so the next slide, there's going to be a QR code. If you're interested or you want more information, the next slide, the next slide right there. So you can actually just click that link there, and you can get all the information that you need right there. That'll be the link uh, to sign up to be a part of that. There's a number of spots available. A bunch have been taken during the first service, and so if you're interested, you can do that. Man, I just think this season needs to be a season of us giving. How do you feel about that? So, three of you, fantastic. I'll see you on the 15th, you three people then. So it'll be awesome. Hey, let me pray, and uh, we're going to dive into the Word. Are you ready for the Word today? Come on, ready? Really, really excited about preaching today. And so if you've got your notes, grab your notes. If you don't have your notes, get your notes. And so on the sound booth in the back, you'll see some notes there. You can grab those. If you're not into writing notes, you can go to the Version app. Search Wellspring, you'll see all the notes, it'll drop down there, and we're going to dive in. Amen? Let me pray for us. Father, we love you. We open up our hearts, our minds to be able to hear from you. May you be high and lifted up, and uh, may well, all that we do and all that we say, may it bring glory and honor to your name. Further the kingdom of God. That's our prayer, that's our heart's desire. In Jesus' name, And everybody said, uh, amen. amen. We are on week number four. Uh, we will be ending our series next week through the minor prophets i thought you'd be a little bit sadder about that but i guess not and so we're going to be ending our series you're still not laughing i guess you want me to really end it today uh, but we're in a series called major messages through the minor prophets where we're actually teaching the word of god and uh, surprise surprise in church so we're actually going almost expository or exegetically through the whole book and so we've looked at hosea uh, we've looked at, all, there's 12 of them. We went through a good chunk of them. Today we're going to look at the fourth in our five-week series. And we're going to be looking at the minor prophet uh, Habakkuk. And I'm not quite sure how to say his name. I've heard Habakkuk. I've heard Habakkuk. I've heard Habakkuk. I've heard Chewbacca. So whichever one you want to go with will be just fine. 
Um, I'm going to go with Habakkuk, but I'm sure that that's probably not right either. And so Habakkuk is our fourth in our five-week series through the Minor Prophets. What's fascinating about Habakkuk is Habakkuk asks questions 24 year, 2,400 years before Jesus comes on the scene. I'm sorry, 600 years before Jesus comes on the scene. 2,600 years ago, Habakkuk asks questions that you and I are asking today. What's interesting is he asks questions like this. Maybe these don't resonate with you in the current season that you're walking through. How am I going to make it through this season? Don't raise your hand. Have you ever asked that before? You ever been going through maybe a divorce or maybe raising kids or a job change or moving to a different city and you've said, how am I going to make it through this season? You feel like everything else is falling apart around you. In fact, you have the ability to look off into the horizon of your life and you've got the same mentality that I've had in many seasons going, even the horizon looks bleak. Like what I'm walking through is bleak and in the future it's bleak. I'm not sure God is even involved in this season. Well, that's how Habakkuk felt during the season that he lived. He lived and prophesied in about 600 B.C. If you know anything about Israel's history, last week we looked at Amos. But if you fast forward a couple couple hundred years, Israel's in a very different place. Israel is unraveling at the seams. There was a civil war in Israel, so it's divided into a northern kingdom and a southern kingdom. It's going to be right here up on the screen in just about five seconds. I'm believing it. There it is. So there's a northern kingdom and a southern kingdom. At this point in Israel's history, the northern kingdom has been completely taken into exile by the Babylonians. But Habakkuk and other prophets are coming in during the season saying, Listen, they're getting ready to take over the southern part of Israel. I want you to be aware, be ready. See, there's a drought and a famine in the land. The land has been completely devastated. The prophets during this day said that there is no cattle in the stalls. Many of the cattle has been actually starved to death or they've been stolen. So Habakkuk describes his situation, maybe you would describe your situation similar to this, maybe with different analogies, but here's what he said. Though the fig tree does not have buds, and there are no grapes on the vines, and though the olive crops fail, the fields produce no food, though there are no sheep in the pen, and there are no cattle in the stalls. Basically, it reads like a Hebrew country song, my wife left me, I lost my job, my truck broke down, and my dog died. The only thing missing is my beer is now empty. Other than that, I mean, it is a Hebrew country song. But at this point, the region of Judah, the southern region of Israel, has completely been taken over in captivity. I mean, the social and economic collapse in Israel is so evident. I want you to just think about it this way. It would be like Europe during World War II. There was starvation, there was nothing. So the Babylonians have come in, they presented this looming threat. God tells Habakkuk and other prophets of this day, guys, be careful. It's not looking good, it's gonna be worse, it's gonna be bad, and you've already seen your friends to the north completely been taken into captivity. They're now slaves to the Babylonian culture. It's coming for you. Be ready, be on alert. Be vigilant. Those who do not die will be taken into captivity. And Habakkuk says this, God, how are we going to make it through this? And I realize in the year 2021, many of you are asking that very same question. Maybe for some of you, you're facing a medical diagnosis. Maybe you went to the doctor in the season or last season, and they said, I'm sorry to tell you, but. And you're wrestling through those but maybe for you you're realizing that your marriage is crumbling and collapsing before you on the outside everything looks fine but on the inside you can't even go a day without fighting and arguing complaining and you're feeling it on the inside begin to collapse and crumble maybe you're in a financial difficult spot you're like i just i don't know if we have enough money to get through the next month we have more month than we have money Maybe your boyfriend just broke up with you. You're like, oh, snap, where do I go from here? And you're looking into the future. 
into the horizon like Habakkuk did. And you're going, even as I look into the future, there's not many prospects out there. Here's the good news. Habakkuk felt the exact same way, and I would go so far to say this, Habakkuk was written for you. It's for real people who need real hope in this real world. Which leads to the second question Habakkuk asked was this, God, where are you? Don't raise your hand, because I certainly don't want to embarrass you. I don't want to single you out, but I think for most of us, we would be honest, most of us would raise our hand on this question, although I'm not asking you to do that. But if you ever ask that question, God, where are you? You seem to be present in all those people's lives. I mean, that person has prayed for a baby, and you blessed them with twins. I mean, that person has asked for a new job, and you've doubled their income, and I'm still living off of, just seems like you're blessing everybody else, but God, where are you in my life? I thought you loved me. Listen to Habakkuk's opening statement. He says, how long, Lord? Have you ever asked that? How long, Lord, must I call for help, but you don't listen or cry out to you? Violence, but you don't save me. Why do you make me look at all the injustice in this world? Why do you, here's an interesting word, why do you tolerate wrongdoing? Somebody say tolerate. Tolerate, Tolerate. what an interesting word the Bible says there. Destruction and violence are before me. Tolerate. What an interesting word tolerate is. Do you ever ever dare, dare to admit that you feel the same way about God? He seems to tolerate the things that you feel like in the Bible, he just shouldn't tolerate. Like if he's a just and good God, why why is he allowing all these bad things to happen to you in your situation? And it just seems that every day it gets worse and you feel like you're in the middle of a really depressing TV series. And you keep watching week after week because you just think it's gonna be better the next week. And then you finish watching that episode, you're like, next week it's going to get better. Next week it's going to get better. I just think it's going to be, it's just like the storyline just never changes. It reminds me of a show that I watched years ago called Lost. Come on, everybody watch Lost. I mean, I watched every episode of Lost just thinking like, it's going to be fixed. It's going to be better. They're going to find out why. It's just going to get better. And then every episode I would watch of Lost, it just didn't make sense and it just didn't get better. I think I'm permanently scarred from watching Lost. I mean, I should have known how could polar bears survive in Tropical Island. What's interesting about it is this. I think for many of us, we know what's on the horizon, but we're unwilling to deal with what's on the horizon. That was Habakkuk. He was unwilling to address, and he spent way too much time complaining. God, where are you? Here's the third question that Habakkuk got. This, by the way, this is just introduction. I'm just trying to help us get in the story to realize that this isn't just an old dude from an Old Testament who's a dried up piece of bone now. Same message applies for us today because Habakkuk asked this question, God, how's this fair? How's this fair? How's this fair? I'm not even 40 years old and I've already lost my spouse. How's this fair? I'm on the, on the edge of retirement and I get fired. How's this fair? I eat right. I do organic. I do all the right things. And my doctor said that I've got cancer. How's this fair? See, Babylonian was causing, Babylon was causing Israel some great problems. And Habakkuk's looking at Babylon going, how are you blessing them, God? They're wicked. They're godless. But it just seems every day they get blessed and we don't. Don't raise your hand. I'm just asking you to answer in your spirit. Have you ever felt like that before? It just seems like God blesses all those who don't live for him. But you come to church faithfully, you tithe, you serve, and it just seems like you just can't get ahead. Habakkuk felt that very same way. Everything that the Babylonians touched was blessed. But all we do is continue to be terrorized. Here's what he says. Chapter 1, verse 13. I mean, think of, get in the story. Get in the story. Here's what Habakkuk says to God. Your eyes. I mean, it's almost like you shouldn't say this to God. Like, like I'm reading it, I'm like, I don't know if he's allowed to say that. 
your eyes are too pure to look on evil. Let me remind you of what you said in your Bible. You don't tolerate wrongdoing. Why then are you tolerating the Babylonians? Why are you silent while the wicked are doing what they're doing? Again, don't raise your hand. You ever felt like that before? God, where are you? Just seems like you're not present in my situation. I'm doing all the right things. I'm acting all the right way. I'm participating in things that I'm supposed to and not doing the things that I'm not supposed to. See, Habakkuk, I can't even spell Habakkuk in Jesus' name. I can't. I had to figure out it's two Ks in the middle in Jesus' name. But the book of Habakkuk is unusual. It's unlike any other minor prophet. Because every other minor prophet, it's a, it's a word that they get from God, and the minor prophet delivers it to Israel. But not like this one. See, Habakkuk allows us into real conversations between him and God. It's almost like you're a fly on the wall. You get in on the inner workings of what Habakkuk is dealing with day in and day out when God doesn't show up when he should, he doesn't say what he's supposed to do, say what he's supposed to say, and he doesn't do what he's supposed to do. And if you're real with me today, church, then if you're honest with me today, there may not be a more timely message than this one right here because you're walking through something you don't think you should be walking through. Something is happening to you that you don't think should be happening to you. And Habakkuk knows exactly what you're going through. See, in the book of Habakkuk, he presents a series of complaints to God. Here's one. Listen to the sarcasm in this one. I will climb up here. This is Habakkuk talking to God. I'll climb up here on my watchtower. I'll stand guard. And we'll just see. We'll see if you even notice me. We'll see if you even respond to my complaints. We'll see if you even answer. We'll see if you even actually know what's going on. By the way, they're your chosen people, God. We'll, we'll just see if you show up. We'll see if you want to do something about it. I'm going to stand up on the watchtower. I'm going to cross my arms, and we'll see if you want to show up. Now, for some of you, you've not climbed up on a watchtower, and maybe you've not literally crossed your arms, but emotionally, you've done that. We'll just see if you show up, God. So what happens is, Habakkuk presents a number of complaints. God answers them. Habakkuk complains. God answers them. Habakkuk complains. God flexes his cosmic muscles. And Habakkuk complains. And majority of the book is about Habakkuk complaining and God answering him. But there's this great statement at the end of the message I want to give to you. You find at the very end of Habakkuk. I don't know if there's any portion of Scripture for sure in the Old Testament, maybe in the entire Bible, but for sure in the Old Testament, that exemplifies faith. like this one does. See, the shape of Habakkuk's book is supposed to teach us something. Here's what it's supposed to teach us. Listen to me, church. If you get nothing, get this. It's supposed to teach you that faith works from the inside out. It's supposed to help us understand what's the shape of your heart. Are you ready to walk through what you need to walk through so you can get what you want to get? So I don't know if I really believe all that. Well, several portions of the Old Testament actually explain it to us. Let me just mention a few of them. How about David in Psalms? And I'm not saying this jokingly, and I'm not picking on anybody. This is the truth. If David walked this planet today, David would be medicated. I'm convinced that David had bipolar. You cannot read the scriptures and not see some of the issues that he struggled with. I mean, in one verse, he's ready to conquer hell with a squirt gun. Then in the very next word, word in Psalms, he's ready to commit suicide. I mean, you talk about the pendulum swing. But we get an inner look into David's life. He doesn't put his beautiful outfit on, come to church and bebop in. How are you? Blessed. Life is great. It's fantastic. If I was any better, I'd be two people. No, we, we, get, to, we get to be a fly on the wall. We get to see the inner workings. How, how about Job? How does life suck for Job? Loses his family loses his money, loses his business. I mean, we get an inner look into Job's life. Days of discouragement, days of depression. The book of Jonah. We didn't look at the book of Jonah, but he is a minor prophet. 
I mean, he's battling with struggling whether he can trust God. Have you ever realized that it's okay for you to go, can I really trust God? God's not as upset at your question. He's not angry at you. He's okay. But with you saying, God, are you sure you got this under control? Because it doesn't quite feel like it. Now, he's going to readdress your question and remind you of what he used to do for you or what he already did for you. See, when Habakkuk questions God, God didn't snap back and say, how, how dareth thou talk to me this way? All King James-like. No, God saw fit that it was okay that Habakkuk questioned God. He thought, he thought it so fit that he actually put it in the canon of Scripture for you and I to talk about in the year 2021. I wrote it this way. Write it down in your notes this way. This is going to be salve for somebody's wound, wound today. This is going to minister to somebody in a way that, man, I just think, I just think it's going to be special. Just listen to this statement. Doubt is one of God's most common tools to drive you deeper into faith. See, you have thought doubt is of the enemy. You have thought doubt is ungodly. That doubt is, that doubt is awful and doubt is sinful people and doubt is what unsaved people do. But I'm more convinced the more that I dive into the scripture that doubt is actually a good thing to allow you to realize the deeper faith that you have it. That when you cannot see, you can trust. That when you don't understand, you still believe. I wrote it this way. Faith that hasn't been tested with doubt is shallow. See, do you really have faith unless you've ever been, if you've not, never been in a season of doubt? See, faith is only faith. <laughs> We're in Ruskin. Faith is only faith when you need faith. See, there was a legendary experiment that happened. I read it last week on the way home from South Carolina. I was sitting in the back of the bus and I was studying this whole Habakkuk thing and I, I found this really cool story of a scientist who was doing this experiment at John Hopkins University. And the experiment was to figure out how, how long could rats swim? So he threw a portion of rats in this body of water and he realized that none of them could swim after 10 minutes. They had all died. So what he decided to do is he said, well, let me, let me use the same water, the same type of rat, the same environment, but during the 10 minutes, two times during the 10 minutes, I'm just going to pull the rat out for five seconds, and I'm going to put the rat back in. So in the first 10 minutes, twice, I'm going to pull the rat out for five seconds and put it back. Let's just see if that changes anything. And in his experience, he realizes the rat swam for longer than 10 minutes. The rat actually swam. The rat swam for actually... 60 plus minutes. Say, what does this have to do with Habakkuk? Nothing changed. He didn't change the water. He didn't change the environment. All he did by pulling the rats out was he instilled a little bit of hope. And I wonder today, listen to me, this isn't going to build a, a big church, but this is going to build some big people. I wonder today if you don't need your circumstances changed, you just need a little bit of a little hope. So I'm talking to the Wellspring rats today. I'm not going to pull you out of the water because God's called you to be in the water. All I want to do is just pull you out of the water for just about five seconds. And then you're going to go right back in it. I think you'll swim longer if you get a little hope today. So let me give you three thoughts. Write these down. We're just going to exegete this book just for the next few moments. Let's do it together. Are you ready? Are you ready? Are you ready? Number one, write it down. There's Habakkuk's complaints. Habakkuk complains. Habakkuk's questions are really an age-old question. They've really been happening for many, many centuries. How could a good and great all-wise God allow bad things to happen? See, it all started with a greek philosopher named epicurus and here's what he said if god is really all powerful wouldn't he stop all evil and if he really is loving wouldn't he stop those who are not loving and if god is all loving and all powerful 
Wouldn't he stop the pain and the suffering that many have through injustice that's run rampant in our country? He, he, re, he actually summa, summated it down to these two things. Either God is not all-powerful or he's not good. I sum it up this way. Here it is. Here it is. Here it is. Here it is. We're trying in Jesus' name. Praise the Lord. There it is. If he's good, he would. If he could, he should. Since he doesn't, that means he isn't. See, what's fascinating about Habakkuk is this. It's an age-old question that Habakkuk framed long before Epicurus came on the scene. Of this idea of, if God is so good, why do bad things still happen? People of faith have been asking this since the first generation walked this planet. So what happens is, Habakkuk lists his complaints. Here's number two. But God has answers. God will never leave you hanging. You just may not like his answer. I'm preaching to somebody today. Listen, don't miss this. Don't miss this. I think for some of you, you've been praying and you're angry at God because he's not answering you, but he's already answered you just on the answer he gave you. He's already given you the answer to life and godliness, but you don't like the answer, so you keep praying and thinking he'll give you another answer, and he keeps bringing you back to that same answer, but you don't like the answer, so you just do nothing about it. So God answers him in three basic components. In chapter 1, verse 5, here's what he says. I get it, bro. You're hurting. You're struggling. The Lord replied, look around the nations. Look and be amazed, for I'm doing something in your day. Something you wouldn't believe, even if somebody told you it was happening. See, God looks at the back and says, I get it, bro. You're, at, you're in a dip. Yeah, I get it. The Babylonians, yeah, yeah, I get it. But I'm doing something absolutely amazing. It's something bigger. It's something you'll never understand. I'm going to allow the Babylonians to come in and to invade because it's going to bring to my greater good. And my greater good is going to point people to the work of my son Jesus who's coming in about 500 years. And when he comes, he's going to make all rights, all wrongs right. He's going to make all bads good. He's going to make all empties filled. And he's going to make all broken whole. You don't get it all. And so when I give you this answer, I just think Habakkuk is still rolling his eyes. Yeah, that's great for those people, but what about me? Here's the second one, chapter 2, verse 14. Here's how God answers his complaints here. For as the waters fill the sea, the earth will be filled with the awareness, the awareness of the glory of God. The bigger thing that I'm doing is not to fix your problem. Now, if I fix your problem, praise the Lord. But the bigger thing that I'm doing is not to fix your issue. The bigger thing that I'm doing is I want to cover this entire land with the knowledge of Jesus Christ. See, everything, listen to me, church, listen to me. Everything comes under the authority and knowledge of Jesus and his salvation. And God is looking at Habakkuk and he's saying, guys, it's great. And I know you want me to not do this and want me to not do that. But you got to read the word of God and the entire word of God is pointing to this Savior. He's my son and he's going to come. And when he comes, he's going to make all wrongs right. Here's the third part, verse 4. He says, the righteous shall live by faith. Hey, Habakkuk, prophet of mine, if you're a faith dude and you think you got it all and you go, yeah, that, and yeah, that, you're going to have to live by faith. Here's what God says to Habakkuk, and here's what I'm saying to you. If you're going to live in this world, you're going to have to live in this world by faith. It requires faith. See, faith is what you need. Faith without works is dead. We know that, right? But we also know that faith comes by, faith comes by, and hearing by what? Without faith, it's what? Impossible to do what? It's impossible to please God. So he says this, and listen, you may not see everything, but I am still working. Here's the fourth thing, chapter 2, verse 20. He says this, back to Habakkuk. But the Lord, let me remind you, bro, the Lord is still in his holy temple. I've not left where I was. 
hundreds of years ago. Let all the earth be silent before him. The last thing he does is he gives Habakkuk a vision. The vision of him sitting high on his throne. And he makes statements like this. If I'm still on my throne, then you can still trust me with your unanswered questions. And Habakkuk didn't like it. Because it didn't fix his McDonald's drive through need. So he's like, I don't, I don't, it just doesn't feel right. It just, it just doesn't feel right. Let me ask this question. If I were to ask you if there was an elephant in this room, you could, with some sort of reasonable amount of confidence, you could say, as you look around, I don't see an elephant. It's reasonable for you to conclude today that there is no elephant in this room. But if I were to say to you, is there lice in the building that you're sitting in? If you would take a look around, you would probably say, no. Because you can't see with confidence, and if you thought it, it would be an unwarranted confidence. Even though the person right in front of you has a head full of hair, by the way, if you scratch your head in the next 10 seconds, we know you're the one with lice. <laughs> See, what does this have to do with anything? I wrote it this way. The point is understanding all the purposes of an all-wise God. Could it be that this journey that God has you on is less about spotting elephants and more about locating fleas? Could it be that you're going to have to push through the things that you cannot see? It's obvious to say there's no elephant in this room. But it would take a whole lot of faith to go, yeah, there's a couple hundred people in here. I'm sure there's somebody with lice. We were walking around Disney the other day. This is probably a really bad story, but we were walking around Disney the other day, and there was, it was a ton of people there. And my little daughter, Layla, looks at me, and she goes, Dad, I got a question for you. I thought it was going to be like some spiritual question. She goes, you think there's at least one person walking around Disney that has COVID? And I was like, baby, I'm sure there is. I'm sure there is. So I'm sure there's somebody in this room that has lice, and we don't like you, by the way, just so you know. <laughs> but the question you got to ask yourself is this, and this is the fundamental question of all life. Is God still on his throne? Is God still on his throne, and is God still in, the control, in control? So Habakkuk has his complaints. God responds with his cosmic muscles with all of his answers. And then finally, finally, Habakkuk gets it with point number three. And that is the life-giving hope. We're about ready to have the drop the mic moment with Habakkuk. I mean, for a couple chapters, Habakkuk has complained. God has given the answer. It's not worked. Habakkuk complained. God gives answers. Habakkuk complained. God gives answers. And he starts out. <sighs> Fine. That moment. You ever had that moment spiritually where you've done this? <sighs> okay, fine. I'm going to trust again. Habakkuk has that moment. Listen to it in verse 3, ver verse, chapter 3, verse 1. I have heard all about you. I've read in the scriptures. I am filled with awe by your amazing works. And then for the next 15 verses... He waxes poetically about the Hebrew saving out of Israel, out of Egypt. It's the exodus that the Israelites had from Egypt. It may be the greatest, I don't know, this is just me talking, it may be the greatest Old Testament picture of salvation. So for the next 15 verses, he says things like this. You've got to understand what my man is walking through. I mean, his situation has not changed. <sighs> okay, I'll trust. And here's what he does. He, for 15 verses, just begins to list things. Listen to this, verse 4. He says this. His brightness, speaking of God, his brightness was like the light of rays flashed his hands. A reference to Mount Sinai. It's the appearance of God when he looks at the nation of Israel and he says, listen, when you don't see me in the future, I want you to remember this moment. Verse 5, before him, speaking of God, went pestilence and plagues. They followed at his heels. What's that a reference to? 
years later than being saved from the ten plagues, the, the plagues that came. The pestilence and the flies and the locust and the blood and all of that. He's remembering. Do you see the spirit changing in Habakkuk? Verse 10, the mountains watched and trembled. Onward swept the raging waters. The mighty deep cried out, lifting its hands in submission. What is that? See, Habakkuk's mind went back to the moment where they were in Egypt for years and years and years. They get to the edge of the Red Sea. You know the story. They get to the end of the Red Sea and they have an oh crap moment. What do we do now? We, we can't swim this far. And they are literally seconds behind us. So you know it. What happens? God parts the Red Sea. They all get through. And the Bible says that the land swallows the water back up. And while the Egyptians are halfway through, they all die. Habakkuk remembers that. Verse 11. The sun and moon stood still in the sky as your brilliant arrows flew on your glittering spear flashed. Took me a second to realize that one. I kept sitting as I was writing this. I kept sitting. What, what is that a reference? It feels like a reference. What is it a reference to? Now, some of you who are wiser and smarter than me maybe got it quicker than me. But it's a reference to when God is looking at Joshua and Joshua's looking back at God. And what does God do? He makes the sun stand still. He says, if I can do that, surely I can get you through this situation. Verse 13. You went out to rescue your chosen people, to save your anointed ones. You did crush the heads of the wicked. I remember when you did that. And you stripped their bones from head to toe. It's the Exodus. Now, how God brought the nation of Egypt to their knees. So in the middle of us complaining, in the middle of us, God doesn't dismiss them. God welcomes his complaints. God answers his complaints. God answers his problems. But there had to come a point. Listen to me, church, if you get nothing, listen, listen, listen. But there has to come a point. And I'm all for counseling. I go to counseling every month. I'm all for conferences. I go to conferences all the time. I'm all for you getting help. I'm all for it. But there's something that happens in a one-on-one encounter with the God of the universe. There's just something that happens. There's just something that happens when a person gets alone with God. See, Habakkuk had yet to get alone with God, and the moment he got alone with God, he started to repeat and remember. Repeat and remember. Repeat and remember. All the things that God had brought, all the, th- all the, th- all the ways that God had brought him through. So after he meditates for 15 verses on these thoughts, he pins these words in verse 16. <laughs> I love this. I love the realness of this. I love the Bible. I'm just sorry. I just love the Bible. I trembled inside when I heard this. I trembled on the inside. My lips quivered with fear, and my legs gave way beneath me, and I shook with terror. See, we love the Disney ending to this. Oh, 15 verses. He realized it, and God came to the rescue, and he saved him, and look at Israel, clap, 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 end the movie, credits roll. (laughs) That's not how life works. After he waxes so eloquently on remembering and repeating what God had done through people in the past, he still hurts on the inside. My boy Habakkuk had IBS. You think I'm kidding. Go study it. That word actually means bowels in Hebrew. My man could not get off the toilet. And when he got off the toilet, walked out of the room, don't laugh because you have all experienced this. You walk out of the room and you go, oh, I got to get back in there. Come on, I'm preaching to somebody. Who is that I'm preaching to right now? What's the point? His circumstances didn't change. And then it says, my lips quivered. My man couldn't stop crying with grief. And he was consumed by fear verse goes on i will wait quietly for the coming of day when disaster will strike the people who invade us see there comes a moment listen to me there comes a moment when you're just going to have to wait quietly there comes a moment we're going to shut up shut up shut up there comes a moment when you're complaining you just got to shut up god's okay with your complaining but there just comes a moment where you're just going to have to stop complaining and even stop getting answers from god and just wait 
patiently. I looked up that word wait patiently. Here's what it means. It means deep peace and repose. I looked up the word repose. It's a musical term. And here's what it means. Just repeating. Just continue to sing it over and over again. Continue to repeat it over and over again. Just repeat it. Repeat it. Repeat it. And repeat it. And then he ends with this. And let me give you a couple things as I conclude. Verse 17 says this. Even though, remember, remember this from the beginning of the message? My man's complaining two chapters earlier about not having any figs on the trees. And no cattle in the stalls. Well, listen just a few chapters later. Even though the fig trees have no blossoms and there are no grapes on the vines, and even though the olive crops fail and the fields lie empty and barren, and even though the flocks die in the fields and the cattle barns are empty, stop right there for just a second, because there's a comma there. There's a comma after empty. See, nothing changed in his situation. God didn't magically drop cattle in his barn. God didn't magically put grapes on the vines. God didn't magically put figs on the fig trees. Nothing changed. Nothing changed for Habakkuk. Nothing. 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 Which is not a very good sermon to preach. Because we want things to change. But nothing changed. Nothing changed. But verse 18 says this. Listen to his next word, yet. Even though nothing may change, and even though life seems screwed up, and even though life sucks right now, and even though my marriage is failing, and even though I got no money in my bank account, and even, you know, it sucks. Can we just admit life sucks sometimes? It just sucks. It's horrible. It's terrible. Yet, yet, I'm still going to rejoice. In the Lord, I'm still going to be joyful. Because God is the God of my salvation. The sovereign Lord is my strength. He makes me as sure-footed as the deer able to tread upon the heights. So let me give, just give you a couple things in closing. Just as we end this time. What do we see in this passage of Scripture? I want to minister to somebody's soul today. In fact, let me rephrase that. Because I don't want to do any ministering. Let me, let me prepare a way for God to minister to you. Let me set it up in such a way where God can minister to you. So as we see this, this 15 verses of just salve for your wound, ointment for your brokenness, I think there's five things. Let me give them to you quickly. Number one, or letter A is this, because you can't put a one after a one. They taught me that in preaching school. So letter A, hope can exist alongside grief. No, no, don't miss it. Don't miss it. Don't miss it. Don't miss it. Some of you have been taught if you grieve, you have no faith. I'm here to tell you, you're in a situation where you are grieving. It is okay to grieve and still have hope. His feelings hadn't changed. He was still eaten up with grief. Then it would be easy for us to equate our faith with our grief or lack of grief. But that's not what the Bible says. Job 1 lists all of these terrible things that have happened to Job. His business falls, his family falls apart, he loses everything. So what does the Bible say Job does? Continue to worship at church? No, the Bible says that he gets out in the field and my man runs around naked. He tears his garments and runs the street naked. That's grief. That's anxiety. That's depression. That's concern. That's worry. It is okay to grieve and still have hope. Jesus was perfect. The Bible says about Jesus, your Savior, that he was full of sorrow. Can I give you a word for so Grief, grief, sadness. He was 100% God, but he was still 100% man. That's why he can say things like everything that you feel he felt. The Bible says grief Come on. We don't grieve like those who do not have hope. Hope. So although we do grieve, we still have hope. Here's the second thing. Hope is a choice. It's a choice. It's not, hope isn't something you're going to fall into. So, hope is something you're going to have to choose. I love this verse. I love what Paul says. He says, rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say, al almost like he's preaching it, and then he realized everybody's texting and they act like they're taking notes, but they're actually texting and making sure their fantasy football team's set up for the 1 o'clock games. I'm preaching to somebody. Some of y'all set your lineup up for the 1 o'clock games during church. 
So for all of you that set your lineup up and responded to that text, here's, let me be like Paul and say, if you didn't hear the first part, rejoice in the Lord always, let me say it again, rejoice in the Lord. It's a choice. It's a choice. I wrote it this way, rejoicing is not a description of the feelings you have, it's a choice you posture in your heart. You're not going to fall into happiness. You can't command yourself to be happy, but what you can do is command yourself to remember why you should be happy. Oh, I'm trying to preach to somebody. We got some unhappy people in church today. And you're trying to get everybody else to command why you should be happy and joyful. You can't command anybody to be happy and joyful. But what you can, can do is command yourself on why you should be happy and joyful. Remember and repeat. Remember and repeat. Here's the third thing. Hope comes from remembering and repeating. You can read that in chapter 3, 13 and 15. 13 through 15. The Bible, have you noticed this, about, noticed this about the Bible? The Bible over and over and over and over again and over and over again tells you not one thing, but he tells you over again. The Bible never tells you one thing once. It tells you one thing multiple times. Why? Because we have a tendency to forget. See, this sermon that I'm preaching today, it may, maybe, it may help you get through the rest of your day. But if you're trying to eat off of this message tomorrow morning, you will be starving. And if you try to eat off this message on Wednesday night, you will be starving. See, your hope that you need is to repeat and remember. Repeat and remember. Repeat and remember. When life saps your strength, you need to force yourself to remember and repeat. Wrestle with God until he re reveals himself in his greater glory. I, I wrote it this way. Some of you today, and I don't know who this is for. Some of you, you need to get on your spiritual watchtower climb your big butt up there come on somebody and get yourself up there and you sit there until god becomes tangible grace in your current life right now and you just keep repeating and remembering repeating and remember get on your spiritual watchtower and you repeat and remember when do i come down when you actually got the tangible grace that you've been asking for you don't stop repeating and you don't stop remembering. Here's the fourth of five. Is the heights of hope come from the depths of faith. The deeper your faith, the higher your hopes. When God becomes your strength, your joy, that is what you'll be like. You'll be joyful and you'll be full of strength. You'll have a joy safely above all of your pain, all of your diseases, all of your death, all of your disappointment, all of your discouragement. It'll be above all of it. So when you do stumble, because let me just tell you something, church, you're going to fall. And again, you're not going to preach, you're not going to build a big church by telling people they're going to fall. But I think you're going to build big some build people. And I want to I build some big people. And today I want to tell you, you will fall. And the deeper your faith is, the stronger your hope will be. And this is where God wants to take you. For some of you today, you've been praying away that trial. You're in the middle of a trial and you've been praying it away and God, God actually allowed it to be in your life. Because it is that trial that actually allows you to have the greater faith. Oh, you're not hearing me today. God, take away this trial. God, I just don't want to beat this trial. I don't want to hurt. And God, oh, it hurts. And the trial, and oh, the trial and the pain. God put the trial in your life to build your faith. Why, why would he do that? Let me tell you why he do that. Ready? You're not going to like this, but let me tell you. Because more trials are coming. And he wants you to be ready for the bigger trials. See, there are aspects of God that you know nothing about. In fact, there are aspects of God that you know nothing about until your field is empty. See, there are parts of God that you'll never see and you'll never understand until your fields are empty, until the cattle's been starved, until your vines have no grapes that's when you'll see some areas of God and some parts of God. I don't want you to get there, and I'm not praying or prophesying that over your life, but for some of you, you are there. You're there. So stop praying it away and get on your watchtower and repeat and remember. Repeat and remember. Here's the fifth one, number five, or letter E, is hope in the future leads to prayer in the present. Do you want hope in the future? It's directly connected to your prayer and your present. I love what verse 2 says. In this time of deep need, help us again as you did in years gone by. I looked that word up, years. You know what he's referencing? 
hey, hey God, um, I know that you did all that. I just repeated it for 15 verses. Man, you parted the Red Sea. You took care of those plagues. You made the sun stand still. And he's, he's doing everything that he should do. It's textbook. He's doing everything that he should do. But then he just bubbles up a little bit more faith and he says, but God, I don't know. Is this selfish of me? I want what you did there in my generation. Like, I don't, I don't, could, could you do that, God? I mean, is that possible that, that you're still a God of miracles today and you still raise dead people and you still heal the sick and you still part Red Seas and you still take away pestilence and plague? I mean, God, if that's still something you do, I, I don't know. I think it'd be a pretty cool, God. You tell me if you kind of did it during my season. And so he begins to pray that way. In Wellspring, don't you think we should be doing the same thing? We should start praying that what God used to do, he will do now. When I see God's goodness expressed on the cross, the greatness of God and the vastness of God, the truth of God to, to walk the Via Della Rosa. I've been there. I've walked the places that Jesus walked. I don't know if there's any somber but encouraging thing to, to walk the Via Della Rosa. To stop at all the stops that Jesus stopped along the journey to the cross. And then for your tour guide or your pastor or somebody to say, that hill right over there, as we've studied history, that's the hill that Jesus journeyed up. And that's the cross that went in the ground so that Jesus could pay. Is there, is there anything greater than that? And in that moment of repeating and remembering, hope gets restored. Faith gets restored. Trust gets restored. And in that moment, I realize I can't attack hell with a squirt gun. Because greater is he that lives in me than he that lives in this world. So what am I telling you today? I'm telling you a few things. God's okay with your complaints. God's okay with them. But he won't leave you in your complaint. He'll always have an answer for your complaint. And the only way for you to get through the season that you're walking through, listen to me, the only way for you to get through the season that you're walking through is for you to repeat and remember. Repeat and remember. Repeat and remember. And remember, and while you're repeating and remembering, your faith is going deeper. And while you're remembering, your faith is going deeper. And while you're repeating, your faith is going deeper. And while you're repeating, your hope is being restored. And while you're remembering, your faith is being restored. And while you're repeating, your joy is being restored. And while you're remembering, your hope is being restored. It's a repeating cycle of what God wants to do in your life. So I want to pray for you. Would you bow your head and close your eyes? The way that some of you are looking at me like now, I think you need prayer. I want you to come, I want you to come preach one day and look at your faces while you preach. <laughs> every head bowed and every eye closed with nobody looking around. I want to pray for you. How many of you would just say, you know what? I'm convicted that God is up to something bigger than what I'm walking through right now. I just think God's up to something bigger. If that's you, just lift your hands up in, in obedience and sacrifice to God. And just, just in your own words, I'll help you, just in your own words, just begin in your spirit to say, God, I realize you're up to something bigger. Would you just recount right now, just begin to recount. Come on, church, just do it in your own words and in your heart. Just be re recount, remember and repeat that God's with you. Just re remember and repeat. Rem remember when you had your first child remember when you first got married remember when you graduated high school remember when you got that degree remember when you thought god wasn't going to show up in that season and god showed up begin to repeat and remember repeat and remember repeat and remember just repeat it and remember it repeat and remember it. and just in this moment church as your hands are lifted up to god just allow your faith to be restored allow hope to be restored allow joy to enter your countenance god i'm remembering that you are going to redeem all that the locust has stolen. So God, even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. God, you are on your throne, high and lifted up, and you are attentive to our needs. But God, I'm convicted this morning that you're doing way more behind the scenes than I ever could imagine. So I submit it all to you. Now in this room, maybe you're, you're here, you're in this room, or you're in 
another room, maybe you're at home or you're at the gym and maybe you've never given your life to Jesus. Can I encourage you in this moment to do the very best thing, make, make that your next thing? And that is to put your faith and trust in Jesus. I'll help you. Just pray something like this. Jesus, would you come into my life? Save me in my sins. Forgive me. Heal me. I give you all of my sin and I receive your salvation. Now to room this fool, I realize that many of you, you prayed that prayer. For some of you, you've prayed it for the first time. And for some of you, you've walked away from God and this is your time to come back to Jesus. It's a prayer, what we call a prayer of rededication back to God. If you're in this room or you're watching online, I'm going to ask you to be bold and brave. Don't wait. Don't wonder. But I'm going to ask you, I won't embarrass you. I would never do that. But if you prayed it, on the count of three, you lift your hand up. One, two, three. Just up and right back down. Awesome. Awesome. We see you, sweetheart. Right over here. Right over here, Amber. Awesome. We see you. Fantastic. We're not embarrassing you. Thank you, sir, in the back. So awesome. Every head bowed and every eye closed. Don't be that 82-year-old guy when I was growing up in high school that always would look around. Come on, just, is God convicting you? Is God stirring you in some way? And in this way, it's to be a follower of Jesus. Anybody else? Awesome. God, we love you. We worship you. We honor you. God, you are so worthy of our praise. And we thank you for these individuals that are in this room, those watching online that gave their life to Jesus for the very first time. God, I thank you that we did nothing to earn your salvation so we could do nothing to unearn your salvation. God, I thank you that we're secure in the blood of Jesus. That when this life ends and the next life begins, our home in heaven is secure and safe for us to live in for all of eternity. We trust you. But God, we know that you are our Savior. But today, right now, for all of these that have raised their hand to give their life to you, God, would you, would you make them, would you, would you help them to put you in a position where you are the Lord of their current life, their current situation? Would you guide and direct them in such a way that they look more like you in Jesus' name? And everybody in church said... Come on, everybody rooting for the buck said, come on, let's give God praise. Yeah, come on, let's get it going. Yay. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Joey. Come on, have you guys been blessed today? Are you glad you came to church? Good, good. We're going to take a moment to worship and giving today. And so as our ushers are coming down, coming forward, I want to let you know there's three ways that you can give here at Wellspring. You can give on our website, wellspringfl.com. You can give in person right here in service or on your way out. And you can also text to give. It's the easiest and simplest way. Text any amount to the number right there on the screen. Let's pray together. Lord, we love you and we thank you for this day. God, we pray that you would bless, God, every penny, God, that is given here today, God, that is given to further your kingdom. God, I pray that you would multiply it and bless every person that gives, every house, every home today. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. Come on, can we put our hands together one more time for those who dedicated or rededicated their lives to Jesus this morning. We saw hands go up. We know that there are people watching online who made that decision as well. If you put your hand up today, you probably had a card put in your hand. Here's why we did that. We want you to fill it out and bring it right out to the VIP center on your way out this morning. And we want to help you get started with your faith journey. It's really simple. We want to answer any questions you have and help you take the very next step. So fill out that. We have a gift for you out there. If you're watching online or you didn't raise your hand, but you prayed that prayer today. You can text the word believe to the number that's